Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me. So today we will talk about biological rhythms in the Arctic, and uh, we're starting off with one of the beautiful views we see on many nights at the moment um, in Tromsø in northern Norway, and the we almost have what is called the Mercati now, so the polar night is almost upon us. So that means we have a lot of darkness and that allows us to see a lot of the northern lights when there are no clouds. So we'll talk about how biological clocks are working in the Arctic. And the title may not yet make sense, but we'll get around to that. As you are surely all aware, the Earth is a rhythmic environment and the Earth uh, revolves around itself and that gives us a rhythmic environment of day and night. But the Earth also is uh, moving around uh, the Sun and in this process it, it's tilted on its orbital plane by 23 degrees. You can see here, this is the axis through the Earth, and while it's revolving around the Sun, that tilt makes the sunlight uh, reach the Earth in not quite the same way all over the Earth. So you can see in winter, the, the Arctic, the North Pole, is in complete darkness, whereas in summer there is a constant day. So the Arctic is summer and the Arctic night. And in this area here, in the Arctic, we have very special environment that is not rhythmic, so it's constantly day or constantly night. But what is the Arctic? Let us define that first. So, as I've just explained to you, we can just find a very geographical definition. And the Arctic is geographically plainly designed, um, defined as the area above the Arctic Circle and that is about 60, 60 degrees north. And that is the limit of the midnight sun and the polar night. So directly on the Arctic Circle, this is where we have um, um, at least one day when the sun doesn't set or doesn't rise. But that doesn't mean very much, really. So it's, it's quite a fine line. And if you stand a few meters either side, it won't matter very much. And for most life, it doesn't have a lot of meaning. So as a biologist, we try to find um, a better definition. What what defines better when what we think of when we think of the Arctic? And there's a very good definition, and that is the 10 degree isotherm. The word isotherm means same temperature. And this line defines the area where the average temperature in July is below 10 degrees. And this is that roughly defines the area that we think of when we think about the Arctic. You can see it's going through Iceland here. It just goes through the tip of Norway, goes through Russia here, goes far down the Aleutian Islands here, and is covering a lot of Canada and um, Alaska and obviously Greenland is far in and the whole Canadian Arctic. And this area very much um, defines also where we can find trees. So another definition for the Arctic is the area above the boreal line, so the area where there are no more trees. And this is the green line, green line here, but you can see it pretty much follows the 10 degree isotherm. So for biologists, those definitions of the Arctic are much more useful than the plain geometrical, geographical definition of the Arctic Circle. So we, we have, of course, day and night as well in the Arctic, but maybe not as uh, you know them. This picture here is a picture of Tromsø, where I live, and the picture has been taken in the middle of the night. So this is 12 o'clock at night, and you can see it's bright daylight and the sun is shining. And we can also get a nighttime picture. This is the same, almost the same view. And this picture has been taken in the middle of the day 
in Tromsø. So this is midday in winter, and above here we have midnight in summer. So rather odd idea about day and night. It doesn't quite have the 24-hour rhythm that most people are familiar with. And that has some um, consequences. So when we have constant light, that means a lot more sunlight, a lot more warmth is reaching the Earth. And that means in the warmer months, in, in the Arctic summer, the temperatures go up. And you can see that as the temperature is rising, the number of plants that you can find is rising too. So the sunlight, the, the constant warmth and sunlight gives rise to growth of a lot of plants. And then, of course, a lot of animals are following those plants. And you have huge migration waves of animals coming to the Arctic for that reason to find a lot of food. And then this is just another example. As the temperature rises, not just the number of plants we can find rises, but also the number of bird species. And this is just birds, and that applies to a lot of other animals, of course. Uh, just for example, all the predators that will have their young um, and will go to the area where there are suddenly a lot of other animals that can be found. So there's a burst of um, plant and animal species that appear seasonally in the Arctic and then of course just as much disappear again as the sun goes further and further down and then remains below the horizon over winter. So what we can see here in the Arctic summer, we have increasing temperature and that increases not just the diversity of plants and animals but also the plain numbers. So but how do all these animals, especially the migrating ones, how, how do they know when it's time to go to the Arctic? A lot of them are on the other side of the globe or are in Africa and have, of course, no idea how warm it is in the Arctic at the moment. So in order to plan their migration, they have to know what the time is. So they, they need a clock. And they don't just need a clock that tells them what time of day it is, but they also need a calendar. And the clock is important for the calendar, as you know. Your calendar doesn't just tell you the month, it tells you how many days into the month. So you need a clock in order to tell you how many days are passing, but you also need a calendar that tells you in, in what season are you at the moment. So this, these two clocks, or, or the clock and the calendar, they tell the animals uh, how they can control their biological rhythms. For example, when it's time to migrate. But there are a lot of biological rhythms, and I'm just going to tell you a few examples for biological rhythms. So basically, a biological rhythm is any cyclic change of a bodily chemical or a function. So one example is plainly um, a cyclic change between activity and inactivity, sleep and activity, or digestion. You can either digest or you don't digest, and that gives you a rhythm. Um, you can also get uh, cyclic changes in bodily functions. For example, your body temperature goes up and down during the day. You can get uh, growth. You, you, the cells in your body don't grow the same uh, all the way through the day. There are cycles in that as well. You can have butt bursts in plants or fruiting or lactation. You can also have a biological rhythm in your brain, in, in cognitive functions, such as when are you most creative? When, you, when do you draw best, for example? Is that rather late at night or maybe early in the morning? When do you think best? And when do you best remember things? You may hear at school, for example, or at work. How likely is it to make errors? You will find that probably at this time of day, for most people, still fairly low. But if you have to, for example, attend a school class or have to um, do any tasks, then you might make a lot of mistakes if, if I had to wake you up to do them in the middle of the night. So the, the whole alertness, memory, all your cognitive functions have a cyclic change throughout the day as well. Some of them also throughout the year. You can have seasonal biological rhythms, such as hibernation, fattening up for winter, reproduction, having young ones in spring, 
molting feathers or fur in preparation for the season or migration as we've already talked about. You can also have biological rhythms of behavior, the ability to navigate or to sing, for example, as, as we have in, in birds in spring, territorial singing, or courtship or aggression, or how likely you are to uh, be together with others of your kind. Those uh, forms of behavior also underlie biological clocks and are controlled by biological clocks. So you can see there's a huge variety of um, functions that we can describe as biological rhythms. All this is happening, happening rhythmically. And in order to describe and also differentiate between these different rhythms, we need to be able to describe them. So first of all, if you have anything that is going up and down, for example, your body temperature will have an amplitude. The amplitude tells us how big is the rhythm, what's the difference between the lowest and the highest value. And then a bit more complicated maybe is the period. So that tells us how long this uh, rhythm takes. And that describes the, the length or the duration between two points that are the same in this biological rhythm. So for example, from top to top, this is for example, um, your highest temperature, body temperature in the course of the day and after 24 hours, you will get the same um, temperature again, one example. So we're using this uh, jargon here now, the period or the duration, to define what sort of biological rhythm we talk about. Because there are lots of different biological rhythms and you may have already guessed that from the examples I've given you. Um, we have, for example, outradian rhythms. So those are rhythms that are, as the word says, shorter, ultra, than a day. Dies is Latin for day. So everything that's shorter than about 20 hours. You can have a circadian rhythm, and that means circa, roughly, dies a day. So roughly around 24 hours. You can, of course, have rhythms that are longer than a day, infra -dian. So by this, we mean everything that is longer than 28 hours. But you can also have circannual rhythms. Circa, again, means roughly, and annum is Latin for year. So roughly a year, anything between 10 and 14 months in it, in at about. You can have, of course, rhythms that are longer than a year. You can have tidal rhythms that follow the coming and going of the water in the sea. And you can have lunar cycles that follow the moon. In this lecture, we will, just for the sake of simplicity, just concentrate on two rhythms, the circadian rhythms, so those that are roughly 24 hours, and the circannual rhythms, which are about 12 months in length. In length. So let's start with an example for a circadian rhythm. So that is a rhythm that lasts uh, roughly 24 hours. This is measuring cortisol, which is a hormone in your blood, and it rises massively in the morning, it makes you awake, but then after lunch it sort of goes down a bit, and this is where most people experience a sort of afternoon dip and have a strong need for drinking coffee which you shouldn't, by the way, do after 3 o'clock because it will upset your biological clock. And the cortisol goes down and down and down, and that's very important because that means it's preparing your body for the end of the day and makes you your body ready to go to sleep. So you shouldn't drink coffee here because then this doesn't happen, and that means you won't be tired enough at night, so you might have problems going to sleep. And then in the early morning, the cortisol rises again and prepares the body for waking up and to be fit for the day. Now, how do we investigate these biological rhythms? In order to do that as a scientist, you need to be able to, to measure something. So it could be, for example, a hormone in the blood, but often that is quite difficult because you have to take a lot of blood samples. So we're always looking for ways to measure very easily what's going on in an organism without disturbing it. And one of the easiest experiments you can do is you take a hamster 
and you give it a running wheel. And those of you who have ever had a hamster will know hamsters love to run in a running wheel. And all we need to do now is to connect this wheel to a computer. And every time the hamster runs, we will get an electric signal and we can re keep recording that. So every time the hamster runs, sorry, we're getting one of these black stripes. And we can do that for days and days and days and days. We can do that for years even. And then we're getting what is called an actogram. And the word means a, a gram or a graph of, uh, so, uh, yeah, a graphical description of activity. That is what the word actogram means. And here is an actogram of an animal that is active at night. So you can see all the black bars are sort of fused into one long black stripe. So we can see this animal has got um, roughly 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness. And the hamster gets up and runs and runs and runs. And when the light comes on, he stops again. All we do now is to what we call double plot. So we're recording everything we've recorded. We just repeat again. So this would be day one. This would also be day one. This is day two, day two, day three, day three. The reason why we're double plotting is, is just to make it easier to see. And I will show you why in a minute, because this rhythm is quite easy to see. But when we then make an experiment, and put this hamster into constant darkness, just take away the light signal, then you can see the rhythm starts to shift. So, and that is why we double plot, and that makes it a bit easier to see what's happening to this rhythm, because this one here is running off the page, but because we've double plotted, we can still see what's going on. You can see the hamster still is active in what he thinks is the night, but, um, because he hasn't got the light signal anymore to tell him exactly when the day starts, it's getting a bit delayed. So every day the hamster gets up a little bit later. And that is what we call a free run. So here in the control condition, we have a synchronized animal. It can synchronize its activity to the onset of the night and stops its activity as light comes on. But without the light dark signal, we have a free run. And it is exactly that free run that defines the biological clocks. So you only get that in an organism that has got an internal clock. So the, the organism knows from within when it roughly should be night, but it doesn't know it quite exactly. And that is why we get this delay every day. And we only refer to um, any activity or behavior or hormone, for example, as having a biological clock if it behaves like this in a constant environment. So really only we use the term circadian rhythm only when we know it keeps running in constant in a constant environment. So circadian rhythms keep running. So not everything that goes up and down is a circadian rhythm, only the rhythms that keep running in constant conditions are circadian rhythms and originate from within the body. How does the body do this? We have a pretty good idea of um, where the biological clock sits. Um, roughly, you have light that is perceived through the eyes, and the information is referred to an endogenous clock in the brain. So there's a small nucleus in the brain sitting roughly here above the, not far from the pituitary gland, which hormonally controls your whole body. And this little nucleus, so this is a, a concentration of, of nerve cells in your brain, sends signals everywhere else in the body. And it does that, amongst other things, through one hormone, which is called melatonin. Um, so the, the biological clock sends a signal to the pineal gland, which sits in the brain, and that releases melatonin. And melatonin is the chemical signal for darkness, and it controls a lot of physiology and behavior. But the important thing is here, the clock itself makes the rhythm, and it's synchronized by light to make sure that the, the only rough idea of 24 hours is directly synchronized to the environment by light. Now let's talk briefly about melatonin. This is measurement of melatonin 
from the blood of sheep. And you can see in the long winter night, this has been measured in Scotland, you've got very long winter nights, the melatonin rises and it stays up all the night and then in the morning it comes down again. If we do the same experiment in the summer, we can see it's a very short night and the melatonin goes up and then it, it's immediately suppressed by light again. So the melatonin doesn't just give you the time of day, it doesn't just tell you when night starts, or your body rather, it, it also gives the time of the year. So is it a very long night, which means winter, or is it a very short night, which means summer? So it actually is the perfect signal to control both the circadian rhythms and also the circannual rhythms, so the day-night rhythms and the seasonal rhythms. But what if there is no day and night, as we have in the Arctic, when you just have six months of daylight and six months of night? How does the biological clock cope with that? Mostly it means there is no synchronization. So the body clock might still be working, but it doesn't get synchronized by the onset of light in the morning, by morning light or disappearance of the sun in the evening. And this lack of synchronization can do several things. Uh, first of all, you can get a free run, as we've seen in the hamster experiment, and mostly you can experience a delay. And this is what most people experience in the Arctic. And that can lead to sleep problems, especially if you're working in the Arctic like me. Uh, in Arctic summer, for example, there is there are 24 hours of daylight, but I still have to be in the office by 8 o'clock. So even though my biological clock might be free running, uh, I still have to be awake and functioning at 8 o'clock in the morning. So even though my body may tell me after a few weeks, this is the middle of the night and actually I want to sleep, I would still have to be in the office at 8 o'clock. And you can already see that this is very challenging for people working in the Arctic. A lot of people cope with that by using uh, bright lights in the morning. And uh, in autumn, when the sun goes further and further down and the light signal just gets too weak to entrain our circadian clock, uh, then it's useful to use these lights. And it, but if you don't use them, you can have a lot of problems. You can get very tired, you can get irritable, you, you're prone to make a lot of mistakes, your creativity goes down, and in some people it can even lead to depression. But this seasonal problem can really rather well um, be addressed with these very strong artificial lights but you have to know how to use them. The main thing is that you use them very early in the morning to give your body a very clear example. Now it's morning. So there's not much point in using these lights at lunchtime, for example. This lack of synchronization can lead to uh, serious health problems uh, like cancer. It can affect the cardiovascular system, heart attacks. Uh, rates can increase. Um, and it can, of course, reduce health and safety in the, in the workplace. Just think about, would you like to be in a surgery uh, that is performed by a doctor who's wide awake and fit to work, or by a doctor who's completely uh, sleep deprived and his body thinks it's three o'clock at night and he'd rather sleep? So you can imagine the um, probability to make mistakes is much higher in someone who is not synchronized to the light-dark rhythm or to his work times. So all these problems appear in, in the Arctic and people working in above the Arctic Circle have got these problems uh, very often, not all of them, people react differently. Um, but uh, that's actually quite a small part of the global population. So why is it important that we understand this at all? And the answer is, it actually applies to a lot of people who live below the Arctic Circle, but haven't got enough light exposure. A lot of our industrial work life just happens indoors, and a lot of people just don't get the strong morning light signal anymore. Or, on the other hand, a lot of people use a lot of artificial light, like your mobile phones or your computers or TV screens, and they give uh, the wrong signal to the brain about the time of day. So actually, a lot of people who are not living in the Arctic have got these problems. 
but may not be aware as to why they have them, or sometimes not even aware that they have them. So that was a bit about circadian rhythms. Now we'll talk about uh, the circanial rhythm, so the idea that you have a rhythm that lasts roughly a year. And that has first been described um, by Ebo Gwinner in Germany, and he used these uh, stone chats to uh, describe how an um, annual rhythm can happen. So he, he used a bird that he was hand-raised from an egg from Africa, and you can see that um, in spring he's measuring the testes uh, of this bird, and you can see in spring they grow, that's when the birds become territorial and sing a lot and they are looking for a mate. And then when that is over and when they've uh, found a mate and have produced eggs, then they start to molt again. So this is what these hatched bars are. And this bird was kept under a light dark cycle as it would experience it on the equator. In nature, these birds migrate to the far north um, and spend the winter in Africa. So the day length that they see in the course of the year varies massively. But what Ebo Gwinner did was he, he created a, a lab environment for this bird where he only got um, 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness all the way through the year. I'm getting a lot of bleeping here. Is there a problem? Um, I will just proceed in the hope that you can all hear me. Um, right, so this is what the, just the rhythm of, of testicular growth and molt looks like in this bird. And then he's been observing this bird for many years, and you can see this is the second year, the same thing happens. And every year the bird does the same thing again, testes grow and then they molt. But you can see the, the internal year of this bird is getting shorter. So every year there's an advance, every year the bird starts to do this a bit earlier until he's actually doing it in the middle of winter instead of in, um, in spring. So again, we have this free run that we've seen under an experimental condition, just like we've seen for the circadian rhythm in the hamster. So circanial rhythms as well keep running. They just keep going even if there is no rhythmicity in the environment. So again, this is a rhythm that comes from within the organism and is not driven by the environment. We can see the same thing in uh, great knots, which is another migratory bird. And you can see they overwinter in New Zealand, really very much at the opposite end of the globe. And uh, in spring, they migrate up to Alaska and Siberia to nest there. And then in the autumn, they travel down again. And they use slightly different routes. For the winter for, or for the fall migration, they basically fly through over the open sea in eight to ten days, which is an incredible feat. Uh, in spring, they take a more leisurely and slower route across um, Asia, where they make a lot of stops to keep feeding so that they are not quite as tattered and exhausted when they arrive in Alaska, so that they can find a mate and have enough strength to defend their territory. So these rhythms are synchronized by day length. So not just at what time the sun rises, but how long does the day last, as opposed to the circadian rhythms that are synchronized by the on and offset of light. And they control a lot of things, a lot of physiology, so bodily changes, and also a lot of behavior. For example, reproduction in most animals happens seasonally. Uh, camouflage, this is a Svalbard rock ptarmigan adapted to summer, and this is one adapted to winter, completely white and pretty much impossible to see in the snow. Here we have a musk ox, and I've brought a bit of musk ox fur for you. So this is a, can we see that? So this is musk ox fur, and you can see it grows really, really long, and that's the same all the way through the year, but what really happens, and I'll try to show this into the camera, I hope you can see it, so this bit here, that's the bit that changes seasonally. So this is the underwool, and you only get that really 
in the Arctic winter. So, and you can imagine such long, dense hair takes quite a long time to grow. That doesn't just grow overnight as the snow falls. And then we have, of course, migration and the ability to navigate that comes seasonally. We have that in mammals, in insects, in birds, in reptiles. So a lot of animals migrate. We have a seasonal fattening, as you can have in marmots, or we have it here in the Arctic in reindeer. Mating, and for mating um, in deer, for example, these antlers play a big role. So I've brought a pair of reindeer antlers to you. You can see what a huge structure this is. Just imagine you would have to grow that every year on top of your head. You can imagine this doesn't happen overnight. Um, so this needs a lot of anticipation. And that is why the animals need such a long warning that the body knows exactly when autumn will come so that by the time it's autumn, that piece of antler is ready for the mating season. And the same happens, of course, with behavior. So this is a, a polar, f an, an Arctic fox, um, Fjellerif, um, which completely changes its behavior too. So in summer, they hunt a lot, they live or birds, mice, lemmings, whatever they can find. Whereas in winter, they can't access those animals in a lot of cases. So they turn into scavengers and often follow bigger predators like polar bears around and, and live off what those animals kill. So they completely change really how they hunt and how they behave. So as a summary, antlers, fur, reproductive organs, fat, all this doesn't grow just overnight. It's not enough to start fattening up for winter once the snow comes, you need to be able to anticipate it. So a long-term timing is required for the body in order to be ready when it's time. And this timing is controlled by day length, or as we call it, photo period. And that is just the um, Greek word for day, photo, or, or light. Period means length. Again, what's the problem in the Arctic? There is, of course, no night and day. There is no photo period. It's just constant light or constant day uh, or, or constant night. And that is, of course, difficult to uh, use as a synchronizing agent. So what happens to organisms in the Arctic? This is a, an actogram, again, of a person. This was an Arctic explorer. And you can see he has a free running rhythm. We've seen that in the actograms. So there is no clue as to when it's day or night. So this person just free runs. That means that he'll be sometimes very active in the middle of the night. And sometimes he's active uh, in the middle of the night. Sometimes he's sleeping in the middle of the night, depending on how long he is uh, going on in this free run. If we're looking at animals, here we have an example of um, uh, snow bunting. These are migratory birds that migrate to Svalbard in summer. So these snow buntings are very active during the day. And then in the middle of the night, they have a break and they just stop being active. So this is a very nicely synchronized uh, animal. So they use what little changes there are in the level of how high the sun goes above the horizon to synchronize their activity. And this is uh, my favorite bird, the Svalbard rock tarm again. Again, this is a male in winter camouflage and a female in summer uh, feathers. And what they do is in constant darkness so in the Arctic winter, they are very arrhythmic. They just move as little as possible to conserve energy. But as the light returns, and this is what happens here, you can see the activity spreads um, just into the light phase of the day. And as we go further down the year, here we're coming into the proper Arctic summer when you have 24 hours of daylight. And you can see the bird is totally arrhythmic and is active any time of the day or night. And then the day is shortened again. The activity is uh, restrained to, to just the daylight. And then in the Arctic winter, they become arrhythmic again. So arrhythmic behavior in the Arctic winter and summer and rhythmic behavior when there is a day and a night. Here we have synchronization to the day and night and here we have arrhythmic behavior. So in short, it appears that animals in the Arctic 
have very weak clocks, so when there is no daylight signal, they can become arrhythmic, like reindeer or Svalbard rock ptarmigan. But they still have a very strong calendar, so they're using these short periods when there is a light dark cycle to entrain the whole year and decide when it's time to start molting um, or to start fattening up for winter, when it's time to start growing antlers. And with that, I'm pretty much at the end of my presentation. First of all, are there any questions from your side? You can uh, type them in the chat window in the bottom. <laughs> 